the reader who likes words, has come to the right place. You, my lucky friend, are pages away from encountering whole sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and, for the intrepid, entire, new books, full of words. Some make sense. Some almost do. Some seem painstakingly selected. Others appear to take wing and escape the net of editorial control, cross-hatching these white sheets like crow tracks on snow. Visually interesting but devoid of sense. Allow me, Saul Luckman. Or if you prefer, Luke Solomon. In any case, the presumed quote-unquote, author of the quote-unquote, novels that make up the beginner's Luke series. I say, allow me to be the first to break it to you that, you will find only, words here. If, by chance, you happen to be one of those unfortunate readers who look for quote-unquote, real, people and situations in books, you are hopelessly naive. But that, is another subject. More to the point, you risk becoming seriously disconcerted, and coming down with a crippling case of narrative vertigo. As the personages and events depicted herein, make absolutely no pretense to so-called reality, content as they are to dispense with the notion of reality, once and for all, and come to life, so to speak, in textuality. This includes, yours truly. I am arguably the least real, of all my characters. A state of affairs, for which I make no apologies, being, indeed, altogether proud of the fact. I am, as it were, the created, creating. A paradox, for all its rhetorical trappings, at the beating heart of our shared human journey. And one I invite you to struggle with, just as I have, while, day in and day out, word by word and line by line, constructing a fictitious autobiography for myself in these pages. What follows, in six extraordinary books, is the uncut, uncensored, and unbelievable, true story of my imaginary life. Enjoy. First, I would like to thank my dear mother, for her intense labor of love in delivering yours truly, safe and sound into the world. I apologize for the pain I caused you mother, on my rather late arrival. As you know better than anyone, I am a slow learner, always running behind. I would also like to thank my father for sparing his precious seed to co-create me. Let me take this opportunity to remind you father, that you still, owe me for the not inconsiderable pleasure I afforded you on the glorious occasion of my conception. I am prepared to accept cash, credit card, personal check, traveler's check, money order, gold bullion, real estate, or a sizable inheritance. I would also like to thank the Academy. <laughs> you guys don't know me, but I think you were really great. Keep up the good work. Next, I would like to extend a special expression of gratitude to all of my family, friends, lovers, teachers, employers and co-workers who, one way or another, overtly or covertly, through thick and thin, encouraged me to keep writing this imaginary life. There are not many of you, which makes my appreciation all the greater. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize all my family, friends, lovers, teachers, employers and co-workers who, one way or another, overtly or covertly, through thick and thin, attempted to derail my creative aspirations, and admire me in the quotidian mediocrity to which you, you know who you are, have become hopelessly inured. There are a lot of you, more than I could count, which makes this, the moment of penning my acknowledgments, all the more satisfying. Finally, I must say a word about the places, where substantial parts of this work, or play, were composed. I mean, specifically, the cafes of the world, where I have whiled away so much of my time, and yours, in the vain, but amusing pursuit of capturing an ineffable existence. Mine. If I learned anything writing beginners Luke, it was that contrary to myth, 
Heaven is filled with cool little cafes with Leonard Cohen over hidden speakers, groovy abstract expressionist art on the walls, and superior Java from obscure, South American countries. I was born to sit out on the terraces of such glorious establishments of leisure, on such splendid afternoons, chain sipping specialty caffeinated beverages, while daydreaming impossible episodes in impossible places. Excuse me, my cappuccino just arrived. I cannot tell you how thankful I am. I would like to acknowledge this cappuccino. <laughs> I sweeten it liberally with three sparkling sugar cubes, stir the tan, frothing brew with a tiny silver spoon, hoist the cup with trembling anticipation to my lips, and, smelling Italy, visions of biscotti dancing in my head, take a sip. Ah. Ecstasy. The simple act of sitting here sipping this cappuccino is its own testament to my commitment to living the writer's life. Which is to say, doing nothing, but doing it exceedingly well. I am so thankful for this ability that has taken me an entire imaginary lifetime to perfect. I am also thankful for the fine pair of legs strutting by just now on the sidewalk. You have to feel good, knowing there are hips like that, in the world. A toast to the miniskirts inventor. I raise my eyes and lock gazes with the proud owner of these exquisite limbs. And it is almost like making love in this instant. The passion, though invisible, is nearly palpable beneath her stoic facade. And my whole body tingles with glimpses of erotic encounters that could, theoretically, but will probably never, occur. There. It just happened again, with another set of eyes. The riveting glance, oxymoronic perhaps, but with a rush like spontaneous combustion. Then the looking away, and the tragic vanishing forever. How I adore you, whoever you are. By way of closing these acknowledgments, I shall paraphrase one of my personal heroes, the great flaneur, Baudelaire. Oh, you. I could have loved. Oh, you, who knew it? Oh, we, who blew it? The problem with much contemporary American, and even world, fiction, is twofold. If we understand many commercial novels these days to fall somewhere on the spectrum between literary and visionary, with much in the middle that scarcely deserves mentioning, it is hard to ignore the fact that we are living a classic catch-22. Literary novels are just not that visionary, which is another way of saying, they are often boring and unimaginative, slaves to a dogged realism. Whereas visionary novels are, typically, none too literary which is another way of saying often poorly written, cobbled together, with their narrative machinery clanking and clunking. Historically, the exceptions confirm the rule. Tokens The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are, indeed, consummately both literary and visionary. These classics have also been imitated so many times, unsuccessfully, even laughably, it beggars belief. Here and there, a contemporary novel pops up on the radar in this magical twilight zone where craft and invention seem welded together, Robert Coover's The Public Burning comes to mind, but those of us literary, visionary hybrids who scour today's fictional landscape in search of inspiration usually come up empty. The fly in the ointment is that, old bugger, realism. Nearly two centuries after Stendhal's novel as mirror travel the tedious highway of fiction, and despite the influences of modernism and postmodernism, the majority of today's novel readers, like Coca-Cola addicts, still want the real thing. <coughs> I am speaking metaphorically, of course. The beauty of a metaphor is, it does not have to be real to ring true. The instant the metaphor becomes real, it ceases to be a metaphor. Which suggests a disconnect between truth, and what is commonly referred to as, reality. This is a pivotal point, that the real world probably is not what you believe it is, or rather, that, it is, precisely, what you believe it is. Which, if you still do not get it, I can only trust someday you will.
I do not mean any of this, theoretically. Theory does everything in its power to remove the living soul of literature, tear its heart out, make of the study of art a hard-edged science. Never mind that art is as far removed from measurement as science is from love. As writers confronting theory, it is incumbent on us not to let our prose dry up in that desert, but to allow it to become a desert rose, our prose, flourishing in the heat and sands of what passes for knowledge. We must, then, for them to be of any worth whatsoever, live our theories, practically. For writers, this means, inevitably, doing the deed. Not just having the idea, but putting it on paper. Writing down not just the bones of our dreams, but their flesh and blood, as well. Literature, at its best, and despite the recent attempts of critics, can never be murdered and dissected, as it is an immortal, yet organic thing, drawing on the richness and complexity of experience, yet somehow managing to transcend its mundane origins, like an alchemist transmuting base metals. The current twin preoccupations with theory and realism conspire to dry up the spirit and wither the soul, blind the eye and deafen the ear, broil the brain and microwave the heart, and perhaps most disturbingly, for us radical wordsmiths who still have not sold out to the man, brown the nose and pucker the rectum. If we are to avoid becoming fiction robots in the corporate world, we must stop adding to our educational excesses, issue the assembly line of MFAs and bottom line publishing houses, commit ourselves to a way of writing that engages in a valiant struggle to push the limits of plot and language so as to awaken, not anesthetize, the reader. Anything, rather than live in the dead world of those cold people, the intellectuals. Anything, rather than subject ourselves to the fusty chain of academic command, the savage petty politics, where the arguments are so heated because the stakes, as someone once quipped, are so small. We must lay our ears back and push on into the literary fourth dimension. Realm of feminine chaos and infinite possibility. Drop regionalism and play with farce. And, especially, always appreciate the bizarre. Love for the bizarre is, itself, transformational. When you welcome the bizarre into the fiction of your life, anything and anybody can be transformed from dog poop into gold. <laughs> Let us begin a new literary movement. I do not care what we call it. Let us start writing novels for people who do not like novels. Because these days, who can blame them? You can please all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time. But you cannot please all of the people all of the time. So let us, at least, please ourselves. Years from now, when verisimilitude is finally understood as a terribly limiting proposition, let our daringly experimental books, often self-published, often ignored by the mainstream, be remembered as the Rubicon that fiction crossed, on its journey into multidimensionality. There can be no turning back, for readers or writers, after our historical strokes of madcap genius. Or so my story goes, once in every generation, if we are lucky, a character shows up who can teach us about reality, because he is more real than ourselves. Melville called such a character a drum and light, after the type of light once used in theaters, that was capable of providing illumination in many directions. May one of us create such a character. Better yet, let us buck tradition and create a string of drum and lights, each a brilliant facet of the hope diamond that is our new fiction. Let us turn away, once and for all, from old enlightenment tropes toward a new narrative of enlightenment. Together, let us write light. In so doing, maybe, over time, our inherited, and mostly dysfunctional, posterity urge based on ego will gradually give way to something more stable, healthier, that might be called, simply, the urge, to be. To have been versus, to be. Product versus process. In the face of a literature of monoliths and petroglyphs, we have the choice to opt for incompletion. May our new writing shine with the protean power of now. May imagination become the new faith. It all began with a mysterious fire, 
a burning desire to go everywhere, meet everyone, see and do everything. It began with a life or death decision to remove the needle of false security from my arm, turn away from the medusa of routine, part the veil of bogus guarantees and pass on into that vital place where, regardless of the question, all you have to say is yes. It began with the wisdom of foolishness, a commitment to remain fluid, receptive, in process, part of the membrane of things as I struck out on that spiritual route 66, the experience trail, determined to follow it to the end. It began with me spontaneously ceasing to be myself and becoming someone else. Assuming in the blink of an eye the role of a drifter, a rolling stone, a wayward mariner alone and visionary on the high seas of chance and possibility. Actually, it began with a forgettable bus trip, since that was all I could afford with the money I had probably stolen. Three sweaty, malnourished, back-breaking days and nights west from wherever across the tedious interstates of America. Feeling greasier than a TV dinner, I ended up in California in a town called New Age City, which seemed an appropriate starting point, a promising beginning for what I considered the dawning of my own New Age. New Age City was a kaleidoscopic pastiche of architectural designs that simultaneously delighted and bewildered. Gothic spires and modernist high-rises towered over straw bale houses, log cabins, tepees, earthships and yurts, next to which Buddhist temples, mosques and shiny Bauhaus edifices competed for space, while the storefronts featured everything from Rococo facades and stained glass art nouveau awnings to medieval placards and flashing neon signs. My impression, shouldering my trusty old buffalo leather duffel bag, containing the essentials, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, spare underwear and Swiss army knife. I say, my impression stepping down from the bus and squinting into the bright sunlight that first May morning was that the driver had taken a wrong turn at Albuquerque and dropped me off on Mars. And I wasn't far off the mark, as I soon found myself whistling along Mercury Street into the heart of downtown. The only way to convey my initial reaction to New Age City is to compare it to the pinch me disbelief a kid feels visiting Disneyland the first time. There was no dirt in New Age City. No crime. No drugs. No graffiti. No youth gangs since there were no youths. No class issues since there were no classes. No racist slurs, sexist jokes, right-wing slogans or homophobic propaganda. Wherever you looked everything was in pristine condition, and the parks were safe and clean, and all the cars were late model imports, and all the people were white and over 40 and expensively dressed even when dressed down, and the restaurants, though exorbitant, featured multicultural menus on recycled paper, and you could always get a decaf mocha even in the convenience store at midnight, and those who drank drank in moderation, and those who smoked smoked only American spirits and the police themselves were shining examples of environmental consciousness as they rode smiling on shiny mountain bikes up and down exquisitely maintained streets. And the extraordinary services. New Age City was a cornucopia of transsexual breathwork, colonic hypnotherapy, psychotic readings, women's foot massage circles, men's menstrual networks, nymphomatic drainage, applied tautology, body piercing for the inner child, alternative unbirthing, soul upheaval, and past life digressions. To say nothing of the extraordinary products available through independent distributors of network marketing companies, self-esteem creams, psychic gels, clairvoyant eye drops, aboriginal aphrodisiacs, ostrich feather energy bars, irradiated healing clays, chai enemas. I didn't know where to start. I wondered about my inner child. In fact, I was troubled. Did I even have an inner child? I asked myself, given that, in essence, I'd just been born. On the other hand, I thought it might be interesting to try a flavored animal or have my nasal septum pierced. Confusing as my options were, it soon became crystal clear the little cash I had on me wouldn't last long in a place where a bag of peanuts cost ten bucks. So what if they were organic? My first instinct was to get a job. An idea immediately followed by a crippling wave of nausea. 
I literally hurled in a trash can on the sidewalk where I'd been pleasantly window shopping. I found the idea of a job repulsive. Life was too short to waste being a productive member of society. My job was my imaginary life, and I felt deeply I should be paid to live it. Such a conviction did nothing to put food in my belly or a roof over my head. The hotels were so expensive one weekend would have bankrupted me. It didn't take long for my homelessness to sink in. It just took shivering night after night on the park bench only to be mercilessly prodded awake at five by a smiling policeman urging me to move on, peeing in the woods, shitting in the bushes and wiping with leaves I prayed were not poison ivy, then finally spending my last penny and feeling genuine hunger set in as a layer of sweat and scum encased me like a second skin. And so, as is conventional in such cases, I resorted to begging. Begging is much more difficult than it looks. Contrary to popular belief, it's a high art form that takes years of dedicated practice to master. Granted, I was no master. But I seriously doubt Helen Keller could have pried any change out of the citizens of New Age City. I tried every trick in the book. I stood and begged, sat and begged, lay down and begged, begged on my knees. I drew little signs indicating I was unemployed, I was retarded, I was a starving artist, I was an orphan, I was deaf or blind or mute, I suffered from rheumatic fever, I had a broken heart. I changed locations and times. I faked whiplash, a fractured femur, an abscessed tooth. I moaned and groaned, gnashed my teeth and wailed as I sat impossibly twisted on the sidewalk. I even squirted ketchup swiped from a fast food joint all over my jeans and complained of intestinal bleeding. But nothing, I mean nothing worked. Nobody gave me a dime. People practically walked on top of me without even looking in my direction. Morning after morning the smiling policeman politely prodded me awake, and day after day my hunger hollowed me out from the inside. I no longer gave a damn about my inner child. How long would it be, I wondered, before I completely withered, turned to a crisp, lost my marbles and took to conversing with myself in different octaves in my own little one-man play scripted by misery's lunacy? One especially traumatic afternoon, I found myself seated on the sidewalk in the middle of Mercury Street being ignored by streams of polite people who managed to be called as distant stars, so engrossed in their own process, a word I often overheard them use. This is what occurred to me, if the good Lord himself had suddenly materialized in a blinding flash, the situation would have been no different from that story where Christ returns to Waco, but nobody lifts a pinky to receive him. I remember slumping side was following this realization and crying a salty tear or two, no longer hungry, that had thankfully passed, but bitterly disillusioned. Later that night, Stretched on my park bench in a state of physical and emotional exhaustion, yet miserably unable to sleep, I realized I had to escape. I had to get out of that plastic place, even if it meant perishing in the attempt. The problem was how. How could a beggar get out of New Age City? Not by hitching, that was for sure. Nobody would give you the time of day, much less a ride. Speaking of, where were all the beggars? Surely I wasn't the first drifter to show up expecting to live off the generosity of such an enlightened place. Sleep being out of the question, I decided to go for a stroll to brainstorm. It must have been around three and besides yours truly not a creature was stirring. At that hour, New Age City resembled a stage set more than a real city, a nearly convincing theater backdrop, the buildings two-dimensional like crushed cardboard boxes. As if they were not solid, as if you could pass your hand through them with no effort. This impression, strange as it was, persisted and actually grew stronger the longer I walked through the deserted streets, where a surreal, pastel twilight prevailed. By the time I arrived at the outskirts of town, dawn was shooting yellow jags up through the inky sky. But instead of feeling gladdened by the new day, a wave of panic washed over me. I was certain another day in New Age City would be the end of me. Panting with terror, feeling daybreak fry me like a vampire, squeeze me like a trap room in a B-movie, 
I did something that in any other town would have resulted in a broken nose, I turned and plunged into the nearest wall. Instead of stone, I passed through something that felt like water but was not wet. When I re-emerged, I was no longer in New Age City. I didn't know where the heck I was. Just that I was alone in a dark alley that smelled like piss and rotten beer. I leaned back against the alley wall, a solid one this time, and took a few deep breaths, disoriented but happy to be alive. But just to make sure, I pinched myself, it hurt, and tried out my vocal cords. Echo. I yelled into the shadows. Echo. 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 The shadows replied. It didn't take a genius to figure out I had come to Perver City. Technically a suburb of New Age City, Perver City is where all the people who can't make it in New Age City wind up. It's full of Jesus freaks and girls who have seen the Virgin, whores and pimps, televangelists and their wives, crack addicts and a heroin junkies, drag queens and dominatrixes, drug lords and small-time pushers used car salesmen and short order cooks, convicted felons out on parole and felons yet to be convicted, chiliasts and pederasts, private detectives and bankruptcy lawyers, clan members and Jehovah's Witnesses, former debutantes and ex-marines. I will never forget the first words I encountered in Perver City. They were scrawled in pink lipstick above the urinal in the men's toilet of a Taco Bell just off Neptune Street. I love Pebbles Flintstone, they said. The teenage one. After all, I'm no sicko. Taco Bell was just around the corner from the free, love, motel. Which had the particular fortune of standing next to a huge fish market with dozens of booths featuring signs such as fresh tuna, bulk cod, and get crabs here. One good thing about Perver City was the food, which was dirt cheap, extremely tasty and really bad for you. I had the opportunity to sample it that very day, after sleeping a couple hours on moldy carpet strips in one of the city's dark alleys, when I discovered, to my delight, a $20 bill in my left rear pocket. Crumpled and faded, it must have been a vestige from my real life before I became imaginary. It was the genuine article and served to purchase a duffel full of goodies at the local Safeway. I had to throw away my spare underwear to make room. I bought a family-sized bag of ruffles, a jumbo canister of sour cream and onion dip, a two-liter bottle of orange crush, a box of Little Debbie Nutty Bars, a giant stick of Rustler's spicy beef jerky, a pack of cherry licorice twists, and a bag of Lucille's malted milk balls. All for the low, low price of $17.95. Which meant I left the store with $2.05 in my pocket, a small fortune. I spent the next hour wandering in search of a tranquil spot to enjoy my breakfast. My options came down to an alley with wild dogs rummaging through dumpsters. Or the sidewalk and the inevitable hounding by bums, dealers, the whores from 6th Avenue and sex shop employees attempting to interest me in peep shows. I finally found one small park. But the trees were all dead, the grass was scorched, and instead of pine needles, other types of needles littered the ground. I picked my way carefully over to a bench and sat down. Seconds later, before I could even pop a milk ball in my mouth, an elderly gentleman wearing a shabby gray suit and a lonely gray face joined me. He seemed to sit down in slow motion, joints cracking, and bones popping. A scarecrow of a human being. He smelled like a million stale cigarettes and, on closer inspection, bore an uncanny resemblance to the late William Burroughs. Did you just get your hair cut or just wake up? He croaked in a cancer patient's voice, lighting a lucky strike with an unsteady hand. Just woke up, I said. Where are you from? Canada, I lied. He nodded. Where are you from? I asked, more out of servility than curiosity. Here. Everywhere. Nowhere. Take your pick. 
It had been years since I had smoked anything besides a little herbal tea now and then. But for one reason or another, the second I smelled tobacco, I experienced an overwhelming nicotine craving. I asked the elderly gentleman for a cigarette. He shook one from the pack into my palm. I placed it between my lips and watched with anticipation as he struck a match and tremblingly lit the tip. I took a drag. The smoke was strong, bitter and delicious swirling down into my lungs. So what's your name? asked the elderly gentleman. I started to answer, only to realize, struck by the strangeness of it, that I no longer had a name. I had already forgotten everything I once knew, or thought I did. I was a new man. I was on my own now, truly on my own for the first time. What a concept. It was all up to me. I was a man alone, a man going solo, a solo man. Solomon, I replied, the name like someone else's idea posing in my mind as my own. Then, noticing the lucky strike burn to ash between my fingers, I said, Luke, Luke Solomon. Pleased to meet you, kid. My name's Norm. As in normal. Used to be in the shoe business. We shook hands. Norm's hand felt like salted fish. Our brief interaction had put him in a talkative mood. There's no business like shoe business, he uttered with a death rattle laugh. He, he? Peering at me sideways like a depraved cherub, as he droned on and on about the good old days in the shoe business, the bonus money and the bells whose ankles he fondled when he could still get a boner. But my mind was elsewhere. I couldn't stop thinking about Luke Solomon. Luke Solomon. Luke Solomon. Who was this character? Emerging from my reverie, I turned to bum another cigarette, only to discover Norm had disappeared. I hadn't even heard him crack and pop. I took it as a sign and followed suit, cruising back into town, where I struck up a conversation with a Jamaican, Polish sausage vendor who directed me to a road, Route 69, leading out of Perver City. I followed it a couple miles, to where the buildings thinned out. At which point I plopped down in a sunny patch of grass beside the road to eat my breakfast. After a brief absence, my hunger had returned like an old girlfriend with a vengeance. I consumed the entire bag of ruffles, the whole canister of sour cream and onion dip, eight out of twelve nutty bars, a fistful of milk balls, and half the beef jerky, washing it all down with a liter of warm orange crush, after which I released a series of toothsome burps, lay down in a fetal position suddenly feeling sick to my stomach, and threw up everything like a fire hydrant exploding. Then I slept. I did not dream. I just slept. When I woke up, the shadows had crawled across the road, and the crickets were sawing away the early evening. I sat up and stretched my sunburnt skin, washed the taste of vomit out of my mouth with orange crush, nibbled a few milk balls for strength, stood up gingerly, pissed on the grass, packed up my things, and set out walking again. I felt in pretty good shape, relatively speaking. I managed to keep on at a decent pace past nightfall. The idea being to put as much distance as possible between myself and Perver City. Around midnight, however, the hallucinations started. At least, I assumed they were hallucinations. Admittedly, it was one of those enchanted California nights you read about, with a copper crescent moon hanging like an ornament in the sky above the ebony trees. But that was no reason to see fairies twirling in and out of the woods. Several times, I stopped and stared as a slim, naked figure materialized nearby, then vanished back into the night. What I stumbled on next seemed to confirm my madness. A vast dark plain dotted with countless points of bright light magically appeared at my feet. 
I stood gazing down incredulously at what must have been hundreds, maybe thousands of campfires. Imagine my surprise when I was able to make out snatches of songs I recognized. Old Dylan tunes, a line from Sgt. Pepper's, the famous repeated open E from Cinnamon Girl. Too tired, and for that matter, too curious, to continue, I crept down what turned out to be a steep escarpment. At the bottom of which I crouched unseen, just beyond the nearest circle of light. Here, my surprise turned to astonishment. Instead of fairies, naked men, women and children sat strumming guitars and singing outside crude cabins. My first thought was that I had wandered onto an Indian reservation. But on closer scrutiny, I realized the people were Caucasians. The men wore woolly beards, the women had hair down to their ankles, and the children were completely androgynous. A cross between Mowgli and Tatum O'Neill and the Bad News Bears. At the sight of the children, my apprehension subsided. Still, I thought it best to lay low. Stripping down, I stuffed my clothes in the duffel with my food, then hid the bag in a crevice between two boulders. I felt self-conscious strolling with my John Thomas wagging between my legs into the campfire light. But aside from vague nods and grunts of greeting, the people did not pay me any special attention. I found an opening in the circle and sat down, rather enjoying the sensation of cool earth under my bare ass. Oh, I could drink a keg of you, the people improvised. Now, I was at liberty to examine my hosts, for lack of a better word, more closely. Everyone was deeply tan, I realized, feeling self-conscious again. My face, neck and arms were olive brown. But the rest of me, where my clothes had been, tended to glow in the dark. Besides being so tan, and having very big feet, the people shared a washed out expression. Not exactly vacant, but not entirely occupied either. As if the sun had baked not just their skin, but their brains too. The men were all very bony, and the women all had very large bushes and even larger breasts. My cheeks turned five shades of red with all those nipples staring back at me. Embarrassed, I dropped my gaze. But I became distracted when, out of the corner of my eye, I could not help admiring an appetizing bush growing between a pair of thin muscular thighs. Feigning nonchalance, I looked up into the face of the bush's owner, who turned and stared at me with the loveliest blue eyes I had ever beheld. My gaze momentarily dropped to her breasts, which were nicely shaped and of slightly larger than average circumference, about the size of Florida grapefruits, with pert, red nipples. I looked up again only to discover she was smiling. I smiled back. You're new here, aren't you? She said, leaning close and shouting so I could hear her over the chorus to muskrat love. Brand new, I replied. What's your name? Mine's Alexis. Luke. Pleased to meet you, Luke. Pleased to meet you, Alexis. What party are you with? She asked. Party. You mean they didn't assign you to a party? None that I know of. Then you can be with ours. She cried. It was unclear what kind of party she was talking about. But I figured it was a political one. I didn't give a damn about politics. But I would have joined the moral majority, if it meant sticking close to Alexis. A water bong was making the rounds. When Alexis's turn came, before taking a hit, she turned and asked, Do you know what's the most popular body part with reefer smokers? No, I said. What's the most popular body part with reefer smokers? Guess. I have no idea. She took a hit and... Handing me the bong, said, barely exhaling. Here. <laughs> Hilarious, I said. Blowing a cloud of smoke in my face, giggling, Alexis asked, You really think so? Absolutely. I'm still laughing inside. I took a hit. Or maybe I should say I received one. It was the most powerful stuff I had ever inhaled. 
more of a biological weapon than a recreational drug? Homegrown, I heard somebody explain. Instantly, I was stoned. I could no longer focus. Everyone suddenly had two of everything. The fire seemed to blaze 50 feet high, spitting rainbow sparks in all directions. Even the little children were smoking this stuff, I remember remarking, aghast. Somehow, I found myself face down in Alexis's lap. If this was okay with her, it was okay with me. Her legs were warm, and the scent of her crotch reminded me of honeysuckle after a summer rain. She was running her fingers through my hair and, in an extraordinary display of spinal flexibility, biting and licking my ear. Let's go back to my place, she insisted. Do you think I'm sexy was being sung as we departed. Alexis took my hand and guided me through a bewildering maze of darkness and light, until we reached a cabin that, to my untrained eye, was identical to all the others. We stooped to enter through a low doorway into a room that was so black it seemed to predate time. I was tripping like a mother and, despite my fatigue, had a boner so stiff you could hang quilts on it to dry. From somewhere on the floor, Alexis grabbed it and pulled me gently down onto a bed of what felt like leaves. And the rest, as they say, is unprintable. The Folarians, such was their name, were a pacifistic people who believed in free will, free thought, free love, free land, free rise, free loading, and freebies of all kinds. Bitter enemies of the Vegetarians, the Fruitarians, the Pytarians, and the Breatharians, the Folarians promoted a doctrine where an eternal life was achieved by abstaining from all food sources except foliage. Moreover, this foliage, whether leaves, stems, or flowers, must already have fallen to the ground of its own accord. This way, eating only nature's leftovers, the Folarians lived in harmony with Mother Earth. With humble beginnings such as sunflower petal sandwiches, and beech twig soup, over the years, their cuisine had evolved spectacularly. I was treated to maple leaf pasta, dandelion pudding, twig meal cookies, pine cone stew, the Folarians cooked over brushwood fires and hollowed out stones, drank from gourds, and ate with their fingers. Since their religion prohibited the consumption of foliage still on the trees, summer tended to be a lean season. But from stories I heard, the leaf harvest was a veritable orgy of food and flesh known as windfall. The Folarians governed themselves through a multiple party system. Not a political one but one in which dozens of actual parties went on, day and night. <laughs> Alexis and I belonged to the grand old party, which continued undiminished, rain or shine, 24 hours a day, complete with live music, fermented leaf lager, and ground harvested reefer, around the fire pit outside Uncle Newt Gimcrack's palatial hut. We were, of course, free to participate in other parties, and we often did but our allegiance was always to the grand old party. The Folarian's undisputed leader was a man named Jack. I never learned Jack's last name. I never learned anyone's last name. Jack struck me as nondescript, but he exerted a hypnotic influence over the people. If he had ordered them over the edge of a cliff, they would have obeyed like lemmings. Jack was a pigeon-breasted fellow in his late forties or early fifties with mouse-colored hair mouse-colored eyes, mouse-colored lips, mouse-colored teeth, and a mouse-colored uncircumcised member that hung nearly down to his mouse-colored knees. I only saw him a handful of times, at my sentencing, at public assemblies and, once, when he came around to celebrate Uncle Newt's 99th. He almost never smiled and always spoke in a barely audible monotone. A thick scar, which everyone said was from an appendectomy protruded from between Jack's ribs slightly to the left side of his body. From the beginning, I found that scar suspicious. With what little human anatomy I was familiar with, I knew it was too far up, not to mention on the wrong side, 
for an appendectomy. It was as if, instead, his heart had been removed. I enjoyed life among the Folarians immensely. Especially, I remember Alexis. Every morning I woke up from a night of dreamless sleep on our bed of leaves as she tenderly guided me in. Alexis might not have been very intellectually stimulating, aside from being able to recite from memory every lyric of every song the Grateful Dead ever recorded. But she more than compensated by having perfected the art of fellatio. Nobody ever gave me head like Alexis. The way she wrapped her mouth around it and looked up through her hair at me with such big eyes. I miss that mouth, that hair, those eyes. I recall one time in particular. It must have been four in the morning, and we were fooling around out in the sagebrush field behind the grand old party. With Alexis busy on her knees in front of me, I stood there, like a savage drenched with sweat in the cool dry air under the shimmering stars, moaning so loudly the music actually stopped. As, with all Folarian relationships, Alexis and I were free to have other partners. But no one could ever satisfy me like Alexis. Maybe it was just hopeful thinking. But I had the impression she felt the same about me. By the time June rolled around, it was so hot the shadows hurt to touch. Alexis and I spent the long afternoons frying like bacon in the sun. Nearby was a stream used by the Folarians as a water source that we dipped into now and then to cool off. But for hours on end, we just lay motionless in the heat, side by side. There was something sacred about those afternoons. Pagan, true, but sacred. The browner my skin turned, the more clearly I understood the sun actually as a god worthy of worship. Even with eyes closed, I could see him. I felt him sink into me at the atomic level, infuse my cells as I drifted in and out of sleep, floated on pillowy clouds of sun-induced lethargy. I realized something about the earth too. I realized the earth really is our mother. I did not understand this with my head. I felt it lying there, felt her feminine strength push up through me, just as the sun's masculine rays sank down. I hesitate to call the experience religious, although it greatly impacted me. But when I tried discussing it with Alexis or other community members, they just stared stunnedly. I might as well have been speaking Esperanto. I suppose I brought disaster on myself. Although if anyone had bothered to warn me of the dire consequences of my actions, I never would have been so careless. You might recall that just before joining the Folarians, I hid my duffel between two boulders near the base of the escarpment leading up to Route 69. I knew such an arrangement was temporary, that if I failed to do something with the food, ants and heat would ruin everything. So early the next morning, while everyone, except for a scattering of die-hard partiers, was still asleep, I made my way back to the escarpment and found the bag where I had stashed it. I drank what was left of the orange crush and ate the last four nutty bars. Removing the milk balls, licorice twists and beef jerky from the wrappers, I inserted them, one by one, into the empty soda bottle, which I sealed tightly. That took care of the ants, but not the heat. So I decided to look around for a stream where I could submerge the bottle. I replaced the bag, along with the empty snack cake box and food wrappers, between the boulders. The stream I found later turned out to be the one we dipped into in the afternoons. I followed it away from the village maybe 200 yards, until I came to a secluded spot with a sharp bend and an overhanging bank constructed around the partially exposed roots of an ancient willow. I hid the bottle up onto the bank completely out of sight and kept from floating away by the roots. From that point on, I visited the bottle every day at dusk. After the morning with Alexis and the afternoon in the sun, this became the third highlight of my day. I never ate more than a milk ball or two, and at most half a licorice twist. It was the ritual that counted, the decadent taste of civilization in that strange, fruitless Eden, where I was allowed to eat practically anything, so long as it was not food. My nearly fatal mistake was growing complacent. Initially, I took great care approaching the bottle. 
slipping away discreetly, making sure no one followed, looping around to the willow. But after a few days, my vigilance began to slip. I sometimes headed off into the woods too abruptly, motivated by a sudden craving, and more than once, left the woods still chewing. I quit following a circuitous route. I got in the habit of carelessly setting the bottle on a stone in plain sight while I ate. I even stopped surveying the woods to verify I was alone. Given everything, I should not have been surprised, when one evening I reached up sent mine deadly for the bottle, and grabbed someone's bare calf, instead. I should not have been surprised. But my heart did a somersault as my eyes followed the calf sonar up to the knee, where an uncircumcised love muscle to make John Holmes weep rested. Take him, I heard Jack whisper in his icy monotone. I was grabbed from behind and dragged through the woods back to the village. I tried to explain that I was just having a little snack, that from now on, I would be an exemplary Folarian. But my shouting only inspired one of my captors to cram my mouth full of skunkweed. The taste and odor were so foul I desired nothing more than to vomit but was maddeningly unable. The effect was like a drug. I practically had an out-of-body experience as I was pulled kicking through the village, and tied tightly with grapevines attached to my ankles, wrists, waist and neck to a large oak at the base of the escarpment. They left me there all night. My skin, chewed by briars and branches, soon welted over like chicken pox. At some point, I must have slept, because I remember the sun waking me. My throat was parched, and my entire body was leprous with cuts. Yet my mind was exceedingly clear. I knew I was in deep to do. All day, I kept expecting some resolution to my dilemma. But no one came near, not even Alexis, until just before sunset when the entire community gathered. By this time, I was so dehydrated, death appeared favorable to going five more minutes without water. Suddenly, there was a parting of the crowd, as Jack appeared, flanked by the two buff hippie studs who had tied me to the oak. Everyone became pin-drop silent, preparing for the effort of deciphering Jack's words. But this time, he did not even speak. He did not need to. He merely held up my orange crush bottle for all to see, then shook out what remained of the milk balls and licorice twists at my feet. The effect on the crowd was infinitely more powerful than words. The connection between the contraband and me hit them at a visceral level. A thunderstruck energy swept them from front to back. They turned pale, visibly horrified, then red, visibly enraged. There were murmurs. Someone shouted that I was a spy. A spy from the Pytarians. Someone else yelled. The Fruitarians. A third person screamed. The Breatharians. The Kandarians. That was it. I was a Kandarian spy. Caught red-handed. Desperately, I searched the sea of curdled faces for Alexis. I finally found her. Or maybe I should say, I found her evil twin. Whoever it was that returned my gaze was not the Alexis I knew. I was as dead to her as someone else's dog. Stone him. Somebody cried hysterically. This immediately became a deafening chant. Stone him. Stone him. Stone him. I had the sneaking suspicion they were not referring to weed. On Jack's nut, the hippie studs cut me loose. Stumbling forward. I pulled the skunkweed from my mouth, as the first stones fell. I glanced up at my would-be executioners as rocks rained down. Alexis was among them, slinging fist-sized stones for all she was worth. There was nothing to do but run for it. I scrambled behind the oak, staying low until I reached my duffel, which I used to protect my head and neck as I stumbled up the rugged slope. By now, it was dusk, and most of the stones sailed wide, but a few whacked my backside. By sheer strength of will, I managed to reach Route 69. Owing to their sedentary lifestyle, the majority of the Folarians were too winded to follow. 
but a handful of the more hardy were hot on my trail. Luckily, they had exhausted their supply of stones. I knew I could not outrun them. I had one last trick up my sleeve. Rather, in my bag. If that did not work, I was a dead man. Groping inside my duffel, I found my Swiss army knife and opened one of the blades. I stopped and brandished it, an insane glint in my eye like Mel Gibson and Braveheart. My nearest persecutor, a young man covered in Mayan tattoos, was approaching fast. The knife made him hesitate, but that was all. He closed in. I stood my ground. As he made his move, I stepped aside and sank the knife into his ass cheek until the hilt stopped it. He screamed like a newborn and fell, squirming and twitching, to the ground. I withdrew the knife and held it up dripping blood for my other persecutors to see. Snarling and hissing, they reluctantly picked up their wounded comrade and carried him back in the direction of the village. I stared at the fresh blood trickling down my arm. The salty smell of it stirred something primitive in me. I dipped my fingers in it, then smeared it on my cheeks. I could feel the warm blood drying in the cool evening air, stretching my skin tight like an aboriginal mask. Counting my blessings and thanking my lucky stars, I shouldered my duffel and set out once again down Route 69. I managed to cover a good quarter mile before staggering sideways and blacking out in a ditch. God damn it. Get your scrawny ass over here. I nearly jumped out of my skin at the sound of the deepest and loudest voice I had ever heard. The deepest and loudest voice humanly possible. If a foghorn could speak, it would sound just like that voice. A moment of absolute silence ensued, during which you could have heard a dust moat falling. Then, the voice thundered again. God damn it, boy. I told you to come here. I was not sure what was going on, or what time it was, or where I was, or even, for that matter, who I was. But my gut told me that something was terribly wrong. I opened my eyes slowly, as sensitive to light as a roll of film. Just expose me, and I would vanish. Grimacing in agony, I managed to rotate my head enough to catch a glimpse of the voice's owner. Sitting nearby, in lotus position, wearing paint smeared jeans and a blue mechanics shirt, stenciled with a name, Ludwig, was a gorilla of a man who looked, and now that I think about it, sounded remarkably like Barry White in a bad mood. It was unclear whether he was addressing me or some other unfortunate soul. He seemed to glower in my general direction. I prayed he was not addressing me. Going there was out of the question. Suddenly, a scruffy terrier, about the size and color of a butternut squash, bounded, yapping, into my field of vision. A male, with prominent, grouchy marks whiskers, he leapt into the man's tremendous arms, which held him like wrought iron grips as he licked his master's chin. Good boy, the man said. That's a good goddamn it. That's Blue's little man. Now that I was awake, technically speaking, my whole body was beginning to throb. Even my pubic hair hurt. I swear to God. I had never been in so much pain. I opened my sore mouth and moaned. My voice sounded inhuman, a lost little animal, crying out in an arctic landscape. He's alive. The man bellowed. I moaned again. How does it feel, to be alive? He asked. I'd rather be dead, I said. Where am I? The palace, he said. Blue's penthouse palace, to be exact. Using my peripheral vision, I managed to piece together an idea of my surroundings. The room was church-sized, an old warehouse of odds and ends, filled with more junk than Sanford and Sons, with high, wood-beam ceilings and tall, arched windows missing half their panes. Judging by the slanted sunlight filtering in, smoky and swirling with dust. It was late afternoon. I'm thirsty, I said. You should be, the man said. 
You've been laying there, like a washed up jellyfish, for 36 hours. And who knows, how long you'd been in that ditch, when I found your sorry ass. You's one lucky mother, you know that. What happened? I asked. You mean you don't remember? No, I said. Then damned if I do. I found you out on 69, near that hippie camp, naked as the day you fell out. I thought you was one of them, till I found a little Debbie box in your bag. I was beginning to remember. MTV images of group gropes, bizarre foods, and Neanderthals hurling stones swam, like spawning salmon, through my consciousness. I was no longer naked. I was wearing my old ketchup smear jeans, and a t-shirt also badly in need of washing. Did you find my Swiss army knife? I asked. I stuck it in your bag. You didn't kill nobody, did you? There was blood all over the place. No, I said. Cause I don't want no trouble. I done had enough trouble without you bringing the heat round here. The floorboards popped and groaned as the man, I assumed his name was. Ludwig rose and approached, carrying a tall mason jar full of clear liquid. Sit up, he boomed. I can't, I said. Then, I guess I'll just have to sit you up. I said I can't. I hurt. I yelled. Lower the volume, Gilligan, said the man. I heard you twice the first time. His paw the size of a catcher's mitt lifted me to a sitting position. For a split second, pain shot from my head to my toes, then immediately subsided. He handed me the jar. I looked at him dubiously, but drank anyway. It was water, cool and clean tasting. Up until then, the little terrier had been laying back, cautiously checking me out. Now, he came forward timidly, and licked my big toe. I turned up the jar. Water ran down my chin and soaked my shirt. So, what's your name son? Asked the man. More water, I said. He poured another jar full out of an old ceramic moonshine jug. I drank this one without spilling, then held out the jar for more. He filled it again. Luke, I said. As in, Cool Hand, or Skywalker. He wondered. Both. You sure talk some trash, to be one big bruise, he said. Your name's Ludwig, right? He opened his King Kong mouth, full of crazy yellow teeth, and roared in my face, as if I had just said the funniest damn thing in the world. The smell of his breath, although not unpleasant, made me think of lions, feasting on warm flesh in the Serengeti. <laughs> the sheer, sonic force of his laughter almost knocked me flat again. But the terrier was unfazed. He twisted up his little whiskered face, and actually seemed to chuckle along with his master at the joke. Whatever it was. Boy, said the man, you's funny. I considered myself, what I knew about myself anyway, which, admittedly, was not much. Pretty easy going, somebody who could take a joke. But this man's laughter was starting to piss me off. Recalling the joint's name, Blue's Penthouse Palace, I said, who owns this dump? Where is Blue? At this, the man lost whatever remained of his self-control. His molecular structure seemed to speed up and explode in a paroxysm of jocularity. He clapped his enormous hands, grabbed his leviathan head, slapped his titanic thighs, reared back and giggled like a mythological goose. Screw you, man. I said. Where's Blue? I heard you, he said. He's right, here. Standing in front of you. You, are blue. I said. What happened to Ludwig? It's just a friggin' shirt. Do I look like a Ludwig? Not really, I conceded. That's because, I ain't one. I'm blue, the blues man. But most people, just call me blue. This here's my boon companion. Luke, god damn it. God damn it, Luke. Hearing our voices modulate to conversational tones, God damn it was inspired to kindness. He hopped up in my lap and started licking my swollen face with his rough, 
little shoehorn tongue. I believe you've made a new friend, bellowed Blue. I believe I have, I agreed. He usually don't take to white folks, he said. I usually don't take to terriers, I replied. <laughs> More water? He asked. No thanks, I replied. Beer? He suggested. What? You hard o' hearin'? I said, beer. I looked at him like he was a madman. Which, by all appearances, he probably was. Praying he was not about to produce poor Ludwig's decapitated head, I watched anxiously as he opened a rusty Coleman cooler, grabbed two ice-cold beer cans, and handed me one with the words, It's Miller time. The label says, Olympia, I observed. It's still Miller time. Come on. Drink up. I'll put it on your tab. The fact of the matter was, I didn't require a whole lot of persuading. Filari and Leaf Lager had long since lost the appeal of novelty. I popped open the can and took a swig. The taste truly really was Olympian. <coughs> you don't smoke, do you? I asked. Why? Asked Blue. You Jonesen? Yeah, I said. Sorry, he said. Don't worry about it. Hey, what's up with these labels? I wondered. What you mean? Asked Blue. The horseshoe and little, good luck sign. Does it not concern you that this beer feels the need to wish you luck? Do I look concerned? He said. No. But maybe, you should be. It's certainly something to consider. Luke, don't tell me you's one of them yuppie assholes that only drinks imports. No, I said. But I do like Guinness. At least, I think I do. Did you know that, in Ireland, the head on a draft Guinness is so thick, you can draw a smiley face in it, and it will still be grinning at you from the bottom of the glass? No. I sure didn't. It's true. You can stand a match stick up and a draft Guinness head, in Ireland. Blue quickly downed his beer and a few practiced chugs. I wasn't far behind. We opened two more st st and polished them off as well. Soon, though, we found our natural rhythm. One can approximately every 15 minutes. Between the two of us, we managed to consume the better part of a case by sunset. Any discomfort I might have felt earlier melted into memory's cushioned chambers. And my childhood. Blue was saying, as if on the heels of a lengthy heart-to-heart. -heart. I don't know if you was ever a child. Once, I said, uncertainly. Me too. I was a child for several years. He seemed to be talking into my chin. That was odd. Lately, ever since I had become Luke Solomon, people had tended to stare at my nose, instead. Suddenly, I realized that Blue had stopped talking. There was a vacant look about him. He seemed to have misplaced his train of thought. You know, he said finally. For a skinny white boy, you sure can drink. I'm part Irish. I think. That explains it. Where was I? You were a child. Right. I didn't have no old man, you see. My mama was a hot-blooded specimen of a woman. Ran him all off. Not that she couldn't be stiff-necked. She always hung up her panties to line dry by the crotch so folks couldn't tell what they were. And damn she hated to lose things. She used to deep freeze all our pets when they died. <laughs> Sometimes, whenever she was feeling specially lonely, she'd take him out and pet him and talk to him. I used to think she loved them furry popsicles more than me. Did you have siblings? I asked. No. I was a only child. It made me mean. My mama had one weakness. Insects. Scared her to death. Whenever I got in trouble, I'd run like the devil, and she'd chase me, till I climbed a tree, or turned over a stick and found a stink bug, and chased her back home with it. Course, the next time she caught me daydreaming, she lit up my ass like a Christmas tree. Funny. The only man she could keep round the house was me, and I wasn't even a man. He smiled, remembering, as he finished his story. 
But what I remember most was, when I was learning to read. She made a point to teach me herself. She was proud like that. But whenever I made a mistake, even a little one, like saying, chimney instead oh, chimney, she'd slap me. Hard. Sometimes, it burned so the tears run down my face. I started thinking if there was, a hell like the preacher man preached, I'd probably burn there too. But then I figured, it was just like anything else. As soon as you thought, you was evil, you was, evil. So, I stopped paying religion any mind. You hungry? You look hungry to me. Maybe just a little, I admitted. Well, I am starved. How about some hot dogs? We built a fire and a 50 gallon barrel, using old newspapers, and roasted hot dogs on metal coat hangers, while seated on empty apple crates. For all Blue's gruffness, there was an unmistakable delicacy in the way he ate his hot dogs, holding them with the very tips of his monster fingers, that reminded me, oddly enough, of Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> I examined his face in the flickering firelight. For the first time, I noticed the gray in his hair and beard, his wrinkled neck, the worn expression in his eyes which, studied closely, were a great deal more kind than fierce. He looked back at me, with the look of a mischievous imp, merely masquerading as a weary old man. So life's hard, he continued, picking up where he had left off, as he fed God damn it the end of the wiener. Screw it. So cement. You know, I've concluded most of the crap I've been through in my time was just that. Crap. I've stopped digging for the silver lining. All that does is dirty your fingers. What about your music? I asked. You play the blues, right? Play the blues. I was born with them. That's why my mama named me Blue. No shit? I said. No shit. From the time I could walk, I could play anything I laid my hand to. But nothing ever satisfied me like Blue's guitar. I jammed with some of the greats, B.B. King, Slap Me Johnson, Chicken Eden Jones. People knew about the Blue. You still play? No, man. Why not? I lost the Blues. You lost the Blues. Yeah, it's like losing your woman. When she's gone, she's gone, and there ain't nothing in the world you can do to bring her back. One morning, I just woke up without the feeling. So I let the blues go and got me a real job. But that didn't sit right with me. So now here I am. How about you? What's your story? I don't have one, I said. What you mean? I mean I'm just getting started. Oh. I see, said Blue. You've left something bad behind, and decided to turn over a new leaf. Something like that, I said. And from now on, you're just going to take one day at a time. Exactly. You know, Lucky Luke. I like you. I didn't think I did at first. You're not so bad yourself, I said. Nother beer? He asked. Why not, I said. Nothing bonds two solitary individuals like a good, shared drunk. This is a scientific fact. It's important, even necessary, for the long-term welfare of the planet, to get good and shit-faced with your neighbor every now and then. By the time we finished the case, Blue and I had become family. Say, where's the bathroom? I asked. I've not pissed in days. Blue stood and motioned for me to follow. I did. I should say... I tried. I couldn't stay upright more than a few steps. Once outside the firelight, I fell half a dozen times, each more Chevy Chase than the last. Luckily, I felt nothing. I even laughed along with Blue at my hilarious self. At the far end of the warehouse, we stumbled through a set of swinging doors, and stood swaying, side by side, relieving ourselves in a long metal urinal in the gray light from a street lamp. Sometime after that, I passed out. Only to wake up briefly, when goddammit started chewing my fingers. I found myself face down in a corner of the warehouse. In one hand, was my Swiss army knife. My other hand clutched a raw, partially mangled hot dog. That was what goddammit was trying to get. 
I must have thought I was in the woods and gone looking for a roasting stick. <laughs> I don't remember going to bed or how I could have possibly managed it in my condition, but obviously, I did, since I woke up the next morning with a tattered wool army blanket over me and a musty foam pillow under my pounding head. My host was stretched out nearby on a ratty couch upholstered in plaid, size 20 boots hanging off one end, snoring like a Japanese zero, with goddamn it curled up in the meaty crook of his elbow, jerking like dogs do when they dream. Wild and lyrical, back on the experience trail collecting life samples, instead of withering away in academe, I made my way, a wayward mariner again, across campus, under a three-quarter moon clipping like a haunted ship through a sea of silver clouds breaking like waves atop the unfathomable ebony of space. I felt exceedingly small, but also exceedingly large, and the things that had once seemed so important now appeared trifling. Actually, those things had never even existed. I had imagined every last one of them. Nothing ever really existed. Somehow, just then, navigating that cosmic ocean of sky, this was everything I needed to know. The moonlight working its lycanthropy in me, stirring my blood with primal, transformatory urges, I arrived at 666 Mephisto Street, and started up the serpentine driveway just as behind in the distance. The campus bell tower struck ten. Up ahead through skeletal trees, illuminated like an enormous funeral pyre, I caught my first glimpse of Billy's house. An antebellum, three-story mansion covered in ivy that recalled, against that, spooky moon especially, the house of Usher. Billy had mentioned a little get-together. But there must have been fifty cars, and twice as many bikes, parked helter-skelter around the drive and across the rolling lawn. I entered through the hand-carved, marble-arched front doorway, into the middle of a party that rivaled any the great Gatsby ever threw. The Commodes, a popular local band on the verge of signing a major recording contract, were playing to a crowd of costumed dancers in the gigantic living room, next to a roaring fire in a 12-foot fireplace. Everything was mahogany, cherry, silver, gold, brass, pewter, and crystal. I nearly swooned processing all the images of Schindler's Persian rugs, Chippendale cabinets, Tiffany lamps, and suits of medieval armor that pulsed, willy-nilly, up my optic nerve. A sharp pain suddenly shot up my leg. I looked down to find a very long, very thin rat chewing my calf just above my boot. Then, I heard an unmistakable voice. I see you have met Ramesses, it said. I would have recognized Billy Morocco's potpourri accent anywhere. I kicked the rat off, but he came back for more. Ramesses has a bit of an attitude, said Billy. I'm the first to admit. But who can blame him? He was once king of Egypt. You never struck me as the type to keep a pet rat, Billy, I said. How dare you call him a rat, he exclaimed. Ramesses is a ferret. You should see his pedigree. Is he safe to handle? I asked. Perfectly. He's really a pushover once he gets to know you. Take your coat, he asked. I handed Billy my coat with my scarf and gloves stuffed in the pockets. Throwing Ramesses over my shoulder like a muffler, I followed Billy, who was dressed in a periwinkle, Christian Dior bathrobe, from the vestry to the kitchen, which boasted, among countless other fancy appliances, a restaurant-quality automatic dishwasher, a professional six-burner gas stove, two ovens, one wood, built into a corner chimney, two sinks, a double refrigerator, a full bar, an industrial coffee grinder, a shiny brass cappuccino maker, and a raised jacuzzi at the far end, next to the entrance to a junior Olympic pool under a stained glass atrium. Jesus Billy this is unbelievable. I'd give anything to have my own space, I said does have its merits, he commented. What would you like to drink, Luke? What have you got? I asked. Everything. Of course, I said. I'll have an Olympia then. In the can. An Olympia, 
he asked incredulously. Yes. In the can. Okay, he said. One Olympia coming right up. While Billy was behind the bar getting my beer, a girl dressed as Mickey Mouse, whom I recognized from sociology of the imaginary, approached me. Cute rat, she said, scratching Ramesses behind the ears. Actually, I said, he's a ferret. Like a mongoose, but different. Billy handed me my suds. You aren't in costume, he observed. Neither are you, I said. Unless you're Hugh Hefner. What's with the robe, I asked. Poor planning, he sighed. Ever since my guests started showing up, I haven't had a second to figure out a costume. Have you met Julie, he asked, indicating Mickey. Sort of, I said. Julie, said Billy, this is Luke. We are related. I'm his long-lost cousin, I lied. Would you like to see the rest of the house, asked Billy. Perhaps we can dig up a costume for both of us. Sure, I said, leaving Ramesses with Julie, and following Billy up the neoclassical staircase to the second floor. He gave me the abbreviated tour. Library, study, gym, smoking room, meditation room, master bedroom, known as Suite 16, master bathroom with sunken tub, guest rooms, art gallery with originals by Rembrandt and Renoir, and finally the playroom. A boy's wet dream come true. Packed with gadgets of every description. Toy trains, model airplanes, remote controlled cars and trucks, jacks in the box, unicycles, yo-yos, dartboards, pinball machines, air hockey, pool and ping pong tables. There was even an automatic bowling lane. You don't do anything half-assed, do you Billy, I said. Not if I can help it, Billy replied. This is incredible, I gasped. I'm glad you like it. Like it, I said. I'm blown away. Where on earth did you get the money? No, let me guess. You made it up. Now you are catching on, he observed. Scooping up a Nerf basketball, I launched a shot at a hoop across the room. The ball swished cleanly through the net. Beginner's luck, scoffed Billy. Beginner's Luke, I corrected him. <laughs> I set down my beer, picked up a pogo stick, and started hopping around. You know, Billy, I've always wanted to do this. And now, you are, he said. By the way, I said, ignoring him, I really enjoyed the Dark Knight Returns. I devoured the whole comic cover to cover in one crap. I'll get it back to you. That's all right, said Billy. You keep it. What are you doing? I asked. What does it look like I'm doing? Said Billy. I'm dropping acid. Acid, I said. As in LSD. As in hydrochloric, said Billy. You mean you've never tripped before? Not that I can remember, I said. Care to? Now, he asked. I don't know, I said. Is it dangerous? Depends on your definition, said Billy. Possible side effects include death, coma, cerebral hemorrhaging, permanent flashback. Are you serious, I asked. Of course, he said. Anything's possible. For Christ's sake, quit being so tepid, Luke. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. So then... Because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's God and Revelation. Come on Luke, it's Halloween. A time for releasing your tutelary spirits. Where's your sprezzatura? My what? I asked. Your sprezzatura. A renaissance term for nonchalant, creative spontaneity. Where was, my sprezzatura, I wondered. Just half an hour earlier strolling across campus, I had felt like grabbing the world by the short and curlies. I stopped hopping and held out my hand. At least, this should prove an interesting experience. An experience, was the divinity to whom I had devoted so many of my days and nights. Give me one of those, I said. Are you sure, asked Billy. Just give me one. I repeated. Okay, said Billy. 
It's your death. It was hard to believe a tiny paper square dipped in a tasteless, odorless, colorless solution could do all the wacky things people reported. An imaginary guy on acid. What a concept. I placed the tab between my cheek and gum. It melted in my mouth, not in my hands. Feeling nothing yet, I joined Billy on top of a mound of bean bags to brainstorm our costume. We both agreed, given our mutual interest, that the theme should be literary. I suggested that we put on gray beards, dress like sailors, and carry a large cardboard cutout of the letter C. Let me guess, said Billy. The old man and the sea. <laughs> Bingo, I said. Unfortunately, said Billy, I don't have any sailor suits. We'll have to try something a little more basic. Wait a second. Hold everything. I've got it. He jumped up and disappeared through a door I hadn't even noticed between two pinball machines. Only to reappear a few minutes later, dressed in jeans and a mohair sweater, carrying a pair of white sheets and a scissors. In each sheet, he cut a hole the size of a cantaloupe in the middle, then put on one of the sheets, sliding it over his head, and instructed me to do the same. This is your great idea, I asked. To go as goes. Give me time, he said. I have not finished. Disappearing again, he soon returned with an assortment of items. A roll of twine, a stapler, a box of safety pins, a pack of magic markers, a white poster board, and a pair of black pillowcases. He cut the pillowcases into 15 or so circles about the size of softballs. Using the safety pins, he attached three circles in, a diagonal to my front, and three in a diagonal and back, and instructed me to do the same for him. But instead of three diagonally, he said, try four in a square. For variety. We look like dice, I said, pinning the last circle. Exactly, said Billy. Now for the signs. He cut the poster board into four roughly equal rectangles. Discarding two, he wrote on the other two in purple magic marker. Please, help us. We are lost. Then, he stapled lengths of twine to both signs, attaching them to the upper corners, so we could wear the signs around our necks. What the hell are we? I asked. We stood facing the full length, tin and tile Mexican mirror in Sweet Sixteen. Guess, said Billy. I have no idea, I said. Two ghosts with skin cancer. Very funny, said Billy. We are a pair. Oh, dice, lost. <laughs> Milton, I exclaimed. I can't believe I didn't get it. That's because you aren't drugs, said Billy. It was true. I was, on drugs. There was no doubt about it. They had crept up on me and suddenly taken over like a good sneeze. The sensation was entirely pleasant, not at all what I had expected. A low frequency body buzz that, actually, seemed to add to my imaginary experience of reality. You were right, I said. I've started. Me too, said Billy. Fasten your seat belt, Luke. Click. I said. And say goodbye to Kansas. Goodbye, Kansas. Downstairs, things were getting out of hand. The crowd had doubled in the short time Billy and I had been absent. And the commodes, halfway through a set of Frank Zappa covers, were jamming even louder than before. Billy and I entered the living room to considerable fanfare. Everybody tried to guess our costume. Nobody got it, of course, but it hardly mattered. Ever since learning that I was not the only unreal person in the world, I had developed an annoying habit of studying people to determine their true ontological status. I studied people in class, the library, the cafeteria, my dorm, around campus, even while running the gargoyle castle loop. Now, under the influence of acid, 
I began to suspect that everyone was unreal. That behind all the masks and makeup, the smiles and laughter, the quips and repartees, there was a good chance of finding absolutely nothing. Somehow, I had lost Billy. Or he had lost me. Or we had lost each other. After all, we were a pair. Oh, dice, lost. I failed to recognize anyone. A swarm of butterflies had hatched and taken wing in my stomach. There must have been thousands of them, tiny things, fluttering and flapping. Their wings were velvety like moth wings. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe they were moths. People's conversations were beginning to fragment all around me. There was no context for the sparkling little oddities that came floating across the sound waves to my altered ears. Congratulations, it's a Buick, someone announced. He is definitely a lesbian, someone else said. To which another person replied, either you watch it on TV or you live it. A statement emphatically contradicted by a fourth party, who maintained, it's a medical fact. Northerners snore louder. <laughs> I helped myself to a can of coke from the bar, then returned to the living room. It was good to have something cold to sip. The taste did not matter, so much as the temperature. I might as well have been sipping cold air. For minutes, I would fixate on a costume, sipping my coke, then realize I was obsessing, and fixate on another. Two guys dressed as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were standing nearby, discussing something called, fecal theater. Are you serious, Rosencrantz said. They actually put cucumbers up their butts and go out on stage? Not just cucumbers, said Gildan's turn. Sometimes carrots or squash or even sweet potatoes. Nobody in the audience has any idea. It's their own private gig. Imagine the rush of standing up there in the spotlight in full Elizabethan garb, reciting lines with a vegetable up your ass. I slithered across the packed dance floor to a window. Outside, the trees were their own shadows against the swirling red sky, that seemed lit from below with blood. When I exhaled on one of the panes, my breath turned to silver angels, that, no sooner formed, changed into devils. My mind felt like mercury in wobbly little balls, feverishly entropic. In an effort to relax, I set my coke on the windowsill and slid my hands into my pockets. But it was no use. My pockets were full of needles. Pulling my hands back out, I discovered that my fingers had disappeared. Then, magically, they reappeared. I pressed them flat against the cold window panes, so they would stop breaking. My fingers, that is. Suddenly, there were fingers on my shoulder. Someone else's fingers. I turned to find Billy, offering me a flute-sized joint. His eyes were cathedral windows and his hair was the frayed end of a rope. He looked exactly like Michael Jackson in the Thriller video. You should just keep adding stuff until you get happy, he said. I accepted the joint and took a hit. The phrase, herbicidal urges, flashed through my brain. We were experiencing herbicidal urges. Do another, Billy said. It will take some of the edge off. I did. It did. It took so much of the edge off that, within minutes, I found myself reclining like a Turkish pasha on a 17th century chaise lounge, sipping a dry martini. If I fall and cannot reach my martini, I asked, hypothetically, to no one in particular. Does my martini really exist? The olives? No. But the alcohol? Yes, said Billy, who seemed to materialize behind me. He passed me the joint again. You reach a certain point Luke, when it is better to break on through to the other side, than retreat back to sobriety. Jim Morrison knew this. Don't tell me you knew Jim Morrison too, I said. Actually, replied Billy, I was, Jim Morrison. I faked my death in Paris. As you can see, I am as alive as Elvis. The joint was down to a roach. I smoked what was left, singeing the tips of my fingers. Did you know that a roach is a small, freshwater, European fish related to the carp? I said with a milky exhalation. 
and a great tit is a kind of songbird, said Billy, adding, and in Japanese, Coca-Cola means, bite the wax tadpole. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, still carrying Ramesses, was back. Wonder Woman and Godzilla had joined her. Look at you two, exclaimed Mickey. What are you? Guess, Billy and I replied. You're stape of marshmallow men, like in Ghostbusters, said Godzilla. Wrong, said Billy. You're Pillsbury Doughboys with black stuff all over you, said Wonder Woman. Wrong again, I said. We were, pair, oh, dice, lost. Milton. What a great idea, squealed Mickey. It was Billy's, I conceded. The commodes were just starting in on Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. Somebody suggested we dance, so we all shambled onto the floor. We danced manically, furiously, like barbaric dolls. Executing a pirouette, Godzilla rammed into me, and I spilled martini everywhere, dropping the glass, which shuddered like a landmine on the tongue and groove floor. Nobody cared or even noticed. We danced until the song ended, at which point the commodes announced that they were taking a short, psychotropic drug break. Billy asked me to accompany him, while he put on his sneakers. Why are you putting on your sneakers? I asked. Because I thought we would sneak out. You mean you were leaving your own party? I said. Sure, said Billy. Why not? Indeed, I thought. Why not? Five minutes later, white sheets beating in the wind, Billy and I slipped out a side door into the great unknown. After the stuffy, smoky, sweaty atmosphere of the party downstairs, the nighttime air was so crisply clean, it hurt to breathe. We could smell the moon on the breeze. With the clouds dispersing, the sky seemed more unfathomable than ever. An infinite indigo, filled with unnamed constellations and buzzing UFOs, we meandered through Billy's ritzy neighborhood in the general direction of Jefferson Street. In the lamplight, the houses looked identical, grand facade after grand facade, of pale gray with black windows. As if, for all their monumentality, they were nothing but wallpaper, black and white prints, two-dimensional murals, similar in their deceptive and substantiality to the gossamer buildings of New Age City. I was struck by the idea that Billy and I, to the extent we existed only in our imaginations, were just as shallow, just as superficial, and equally susceptible to being erased without a trace. Turning at last onto Jefferson, we passed a Goliath of a black man, bundled up in an old army blanket, shaking a change cup outside Carthage Milk. Support, the, United, Negro, Pizza, Fund, his bass voice bellowed, the voice was so familiar I would have sworn on the complete works of Shakespeare that it belonged to my old friend Blue. Support the United Negro Pizza Fund, the man bellowed again. I was on the verge of walking up and giving him a tearful reunion hug. When I realized it was not Blue, after all, but an enormous white guy in black makeup. He was only dressed up as a beggar. Jefferson Street at Halloween made a Grateful Dead show look like a Quaker fish fry. I wanted to be the curious little cell that moves among all the other little cells, and gets to know every last one of them. I was so fascinated by everybody and everything, Billy had to drag me like a kid through the crowd. Finally, we squeezed into a spot against the window at the bb and t Arcade, where we could stand just outside the flow of people and watch the costumes file by and file by they did, by the thousands. Zombies, mummies, skeletons, and scarecrows. Witches, werewolves, vampires, and demons. Wizards of Oz, Tin Men, Peter Pans, Tinker Bells, Cinderella's, Snow Whites, The Seven Dwarfs, Little Mermaids, and Little Red Riding Hoods. King Arthur's, Queen Nevere's, Lancelot's, Merlin's, Morgan Le Fay's, Mad Hatters, March Hares, Easter Bunnies, Santa Clauses, and Tooth Fairies. 
centaurs, leprechauns, bigfoots, Loch Ness monsters, Humpty Dumpties, presidents, first ladies, and ladies of the night, Madonnas, Mick Jaggers, Bruce Springsteens, Alice Coopers, Johnny Carsons, Larry Birds, Bruce Lees, Mohammed Ali's, and Mr. T's. Road Runners, Elmer Fudds, Yosemite Sam's, Tweety Birds, Tom's, Jerry's, Betty Boops's, The Smurfs, and The Wonder Twins. We saw the Doobie Brothers, dressed as eight-foot joints. The Red Hot Chili Peppers with socks on you know what's. The Brady Bunch, Charlie's Angels, The Fruit of the Loom Guys, The Mascot for Trojan Condoms, The Village People, The Jackson Five, Parliament Funkadelic, the full cast of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, a woman covered in pink slime calling herself Victoria's Secretion. <laughs> One dude walked past with a real pumpkin for a head, rapping over and over in a goofy tenor. Hap, hap, happy Halloween. Last night, god damn it, I had a wet dream. Hap, hap, happy Halloween. The neon thrill and hum of Jefferson Street were perfectly calibrated to jibe with my chemically transfigured brain. I found myself mesmerized, hypnotized, moving and grooving, writhing and undulating to music that was no less loud for being internal. The music was part of me, playing in my bones. My organs were dancing. Then, my muscles started to twitch, lightly but uncontrollably, rippling the surface of my skin like shifting desert sands. And then I found myself losing myself. Something had gone wrong. Whatever was making the music had just short-circuited, blown a fuse. I struggled to stay calm, but panic rolled through me in icy hot waves, Bengay applied to my tissues and allowed to radiate, unstoppably, outward. Suddenly, my muscles were a million little hands clapping an interminable encore, and the butterflies, or moths, in my stomach grew razor wings. I shivered as astral cold howled through me. Wind instead of blood. Gazing up at the moon, I could hear my body whistling. Are you okay Luke? Billy's voice arrived from an interstellar distance. It was necessary to focus, simply to make out what language he was speaking. Luke talk to me. Talk to me man. Come in, Luke. This is ground control. Do you read? Rising on acid wings, I became deaf to reason. Suddenly, my body had a mind of its own. Rather, I felt my mind divide from my body, so that I was two people standing there who hardly knew each other. Then, my mind started to run, and my body followed. Desperately, I pushed and elbowed my way through the crowd. Billy tried to follow, but was no match for my adrenaline. I made it all the way down to Bojangles. We're locking the restroom door behind me, and then freezing in front of the mirror, I failed to recognize myself. So, I pretended to be other people. I slumped riddled with imaginary arrows like Saint Sebastian, raised an imaginary sword like Joan of Arc, shook my fingers like Richard Nixon, flipped myself off like Jerry Rubin, pursed my lips like Marilyn Monroe, made a peace sign like John Lennon, stared with bug eyes like Salvador Dali, banged the sink like Nikita Khrushchev, saluted like Adolf Hitler. I even have a vague memory of transforming into Pee Wee Herman and dancing the tequila across the checkered floor. I was dozens, hundreds of different people. The one person I was not, was Luke Solomon. Maybe, I never had been. Maybe, I never would be again. With a jolt of fear as riveting as the smell of gunpowder, I realized I was being watched. Watched with murderous intensity. I could feel somebody's gaze like a physical force, air blowing against me. Ghost flesh prickled my skin, and my hair stood on end, as I became perfectly still. In the fluorescent silence, I could hear the rise and fall of heavy breathing behind me. Turning, I came face to face with what I could only identify as a spirit, half black and half white divided neatly down the middle like a schizophrenic silhouette. And I knew that this spirit had come to kill me. I bolted out of the restroom, out the front door, 
across the parking lot, running for my imaginary life. The moon had disappeared, and the sky was liquid with impending rain. Leaves swirled audibly under the street lamps. Cars cast vampiric shadows on the sides of the buildings. Pulpit Hill had tilted sideways like a cruise liner in a hurricane. Then, as if through a trap door in the sky, a dense, leaden rain began to fall. I pushed my way through it, literally through the rain, that did not actually fall, but simply hovered in midair waiting to encounter me. Back at the BB&T arcade, Billy was nowhere to be found. A jag of lightning like a burning spider web illuminated the sky over Jefferson Street. Thunder followed sharp and quick, ricocheting off the gothic buildings and ringing metallically in my ears. There was another flash. It seemed to strike me, this time. I felt electrified, microwaved. As if the drug in my system had just been stimulated to dangerous, untested vibratory frequencies. I no longer knew where I was. I no longer knew anything. It seemed that everything had already happened. Or that nothing had. Everything was nothing, and the things that had already happened would happen a million future times. No new characters, just new faces. I was dying. Of course. This was it. Curtain. I dropped to my knees on the sidewalk and prayed to Jesus for another crack at life. But then, I became confused, unable to recall who Jesus' father was. Why this should have been important, I cannot venture to guess. But it got me on the subject of fathers. I realized, with an incredible sensation of vertigo, that I was old enough to be my own father. Then, I heard the breathing behind me again. Rising slowly to my feet, I turned to find the spirit devouring me with hungry eyes. It stepped forward. This time, I did not run away. With its white hand, it reached out and grabbed my throat. Its fingers were like the moons of Jupiter. I had never felt anything so cold. In a primitive survival response, one that surprised us both, I broke the spirit's grip with a swift uppercut, and before it could recover, still acting on instinct, lowered my shoulder and tackled it around the midsection. <gasps> Locked like lovers, the two of us plummeted toward the sidewalk. But instead of encountering concrete, we just kept falling. Down, down, and down. Would somebody call a witch doctor? The voice was Billy's. It sounded high up, and far away, like church bells muted by snow, and was the last thing I heard, before the abyss slammed shut overhead. The next thing I knew, I was standing on packed dirt, blinking up into a circle of stadium floodlights. As my vision adjusted, I saw that I was alone on what appeared to be the floor of the Roman Colosseum. Rows on rows of tan people in togas and baseball caps were spectating. They were waiting for the evening's entertainment to begin, it occurred to me, and I was it. Or part of it. My clothes felt funny. Very. Looking down, I discovered that I was not myself anymore. While falling, I had transformed into Batman from The Dark Knight Returns. Something like Batman, anyway. I was decked out in the full array. Spike boots, spandex tights, utility belt, breastplate, gloves, cape, helmet. And I was armed with a bazooka, like the one Batman carried when Superman made the nearly fatal mistake of trying to arrest him on the streets of Gotham City. A chilling murmur traveled through the crowd, as my gut told me that I was no longer alone. I spun around to meet my opponent, whoever he was. But no one was there. Then, I heard him. An eerie, incoming sound like a guided missile directly overhead. I looked up, just in time to see the spirit descending against the floodlights. He was bigger than I remembered, much bigger. Bigger than Blue. Bigger than the mutant leader. If I die, I told myself, a little comic book bubble popping up beside my head with my thoughts printed in it, at least, it is going to be a hell of a show. I raised my bazooka and fired. Boom. The crowd went nuts. 
I couldn't see two inches in front of me for the smoke. But then, I felt icy fingers wrap around my throat from behind. Where the hell did he come from? The slippery bastard. I sent a steel capped elbow into his ribs, whack, then spun away and fired at point blank range. The crowd roared again. But half a second later, the bazooka went flying out of my hands like a spooked bird, as something like a meteor exploded under my chin. Kaboom. Luckily, I was wearing my titanium helmet with chin guard. I landed flat on my back, blinking up through tears at the lights, seeing double, nearly deafened by the hysterical roar of the crowd. Then, the spirit was on top of me, huge and powerful, pinning me to the ground, and choking the life out of me. I grabbed one of his hands, the black one this time, so hot it burned through my reinforced leather glove. Energized by the pain, I mustered the strength to kick the spirit off, and roll onto my feet. He came up swinging but out of control, which gave me the perfect opportunity to land a stinging left to his kisser. Thump. Dazed, he wobbled back a couple of steps, allowing me to extend, and deliver a wicked kick to the family jewels. Crack. Doubling him over, at which point, I karate chopped him on the soft spot at the base of the skull. Chuck. That last chop would have dropped her I know. But it did not drop him. Just the opposite. He staggered back, true, and for a second, teetered as if he was about to collapse. The crowd, on the verge of pandemonium, started doing the wave. But his next move, was a real showstopper. Gathering himself and rising up like a giant, he transformed before my astonished eyes into none other than Darth Vader. Come to Papa, he said in a digitized James Earl Jones voice, as his lightsaber flamed a hellish red. Out of breath and out of ammo, I was out of tricks, to boot. It seemed impossible to top that, one. Darth Vader approached with thunderous steps, inhaling and exhaling like an iron lung, lightsaber buzzing like a bug zapper, his shadow inching over me. The crowd, which had been on my side, suddenly switched allegiance and started demanding my execution. Kill Solo Man. Kill Solo Man. Kill Solo Man. Believe in yourself Luke, a tiny voice inside me whispered. I recognized it as my own voice, unmistakable if barely audible over the chanting. You must, believe in yourself, the voice insisted. I thought I understood. If I was to survive, I must, literally, believe myself into being. This, of course, was essentially no different from what I had always done. I had simply believed in myself until, in fact, I existed. And so, believing that I was Luke Skywalker as a Jedi Knight, I became him. My lightsaber sang, as I fingered its activation matrix. I could feel the force, or was it, the farce? Flowing through me into the neon green blade. Darth Vader stopped advancing and took stock of the changed circumstances. He seemed to grin through his toothy black mask. The crowd hushed, then burst into chairs again. I had won them back over. I aimed a fierce blow between Darth Vader's eyes. He parried my attack and thrust at my chest. I sidestepped as his saber hung past, and went for his legs. Deftly hopping over my blade, he nearly took my head off with a slashing roundabout. After another half dozen exchanges, we locked blades, green on red, in a savage test of will. Resistance is futile, he said. Wrong sci-fi movie, I replied, suddenly falling back and rolling away as, caught off guard, he lost his balance, and crashed forward like a piano to the ground. In a flash, I was standing over him with my lightsaber blazing mere millimeters from his neck. The crowd fell utterly silent. What are you waiting for Luke? He asked. Finish it. I want to ask you a question, I said. Go ahead, he said. I'm all ears. Why, did you come here? I asked. Why, did you try to kill me? That's two questions. Answer, I said. I was assigned to you. Special case number 8675309. I was just doing my job. Assigned, to me? I said. Doing your, job? Yeah. Don't take it personally. 
dreams and deliriums have a way of ending, just when you are on the verge of a revelation. Suddenly, I was pulled skyward by a tractor beam. Darth Vader shrank where he lay, until he was no bigger than Curious George. I'll be back, Skywalker, he shouted. Next time, you won't get away so easily. Darth Vader, the Colosseum, the floodlights, the people in togas and baseball caps, my lightsaber. Everything disappeared, as I re-emerged from the sidewalk, and opened my eyes to find myself lying in Billy's lap. A high school kid dressed as a Japanese maple was passed out across my legs. We were in the middle of the BB&T arcade, surrounded by a small but animated crowd of late-night revelers that included the Terminator, Winnie the Pooh, the Cat and the Hat, James and the Giant Peach, Puff the Magic Dragon, Angus from ACDC, Cindy Lauper, Reggie Jackson, and a young lesbian couple in a Siamese Santa Claus outfit. I stared up at Billy, who was staring down at me with a beatific expression. Later, he explained that during my descent into the abyss, he had hallucinated that I was Christ and he was Mary Magdalene. Welcome back, my love, he said. Having reached the summit of Acid Mountain and planted our flag, we hiked back to Billy's house downhill. With the exception of a handful of stragglers, like ourselves, the Jefferson Street crowd had mostly dispersed. It must have been around three. But that was just a guess, as I had somehow lost my watch. Maybe it had been stolen while I was out, or maybe I had left it with my lightsaber in the abyss. Through the bare tree limbs, the cold moon was setting in a perfectly cloudless sky. Noting the dryness of my clothes, I asked Billy, wasn't there, like, a thunderstorm? Like, no, he said. Not even a little one? I asked. Not even a drop. Look at the sidewalks. I did. The sidewalks were as dry as sandpaper. The thunderstorm had been entirely in my head. Fortunately, it seemed to be blowing out. The howling was much quieter now, hardly above a whisper. I had no idea what to expect back at Billy's house. I certainly didn't expect the orgy we walked into. Wall to wall flesh greeted us. The majority of the people were totally naked. Nude undergraduates were swimming in the pool, smoking in the jacuzzi, lounging in the kitchen, serving themselves at the bar, playing drinking games at the dining room table, passing a glow in a dark frisbee in the hall. Seeing his guests so at ease, Billy became inspired, and stripped down to the buff where he stood. Meanwhile, drawn by a compelling, acoustic version of Bella Lugosi's Dead, I wandered into the living room, where the commodes were still going strong. Most of the people dancing had, for one reason or another, remained in costume. I ran into several of my fellow students from Mrs. McGoo's creative writing one, oh, one. Penny Ginny dressed as Gertrude Stein, Reginald as Spike Lee, and Tamra Love as Pocahontas, wearing a headdress of peacock feathers, and a vest made of dried peach skins. On an impulse, I lay down in the middle of the floor, and started dancing on my back. It was a way of grounding myself, I suppose, after soaring so high. Or so low. Or so low. I must have made some spectacle, writhing on the floor like an epileptic caterpillar, because nearly everyone stopped dancing to watch. The attention spurred me on to even more convulsions and convolutions. I was lucky I didn't pick up a shard of martini glass. Someone was kneeling beside me. I turned to find Vanessa Hope, dressed as a flapper, in a silver miniskirt and black fishnets, smoking a cigarette at the end of an alabaster tube. Breathtaking in its double-edged loveliness, her image seemed to enclose and reject me simultaneously, advancing and receding like a benevolent succubus, a nightmare made in heaven. I didn't realize you knew how to break dance, she said. I don't, I said. Could have fooled me, she replied. I watched, fascinated, as smoke from her cigarette coiled slowly upward and disintegrated into a patchwork of tiny, prismatic cubes. 
Aren't you a Skidmore? She asked. A what? A Skidmore scholar, she repeated. I just now made the connection. I remember seeing you at the reception in August. I remember you too, I said. You were speaking French with one of the trustees. The fat bald guy with the gold front tooth. That's right, she said. She was quiet a second, biting her scarlet lower lip. Luke, if it means anything to you, I really enjoyed your story. I've been meaning to tell you. I didn't actually think you were gay. You didn't? I said. You're not, are you? Not to my knowledge, I said. Anyway, she continued, it felt like the class was awfully hard on you. Well, I can be awfully hard on myself, I interrupted. I've got one right now, in fact. What? She said. Nothing. Why are you looking at me like that? She asked. How am I looking at you? Like you aren't drugs, she said. Sorry, I said. It's just... It's just your color. I mean, your colors are so... Vibrant. Luke, are you tripping? Sort of, I said. Moi aussi, she exclaimed. Excellent, I said. Then you'll understand. Follow me. I took her hand, how soft it was, and led her up to the second floor, where I had the distinct impression that all of the bedrooms, including suite 16, were in use. In the playroom, a group of fantastically stoned people were huddled around one of the ping-pong tables, playing a frenzy at free-for-all, using trivets, cutting boards, spatulas, and cooking spoons as paddles. This is amazing! exclaimed Vanessa. I've never seen anything like it. Luke, what are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? I asked. Conjugating French verbs? May we? I said. I had remembered I had a French midterm the next morning. I explained the situation to Vanessa. She agreed to help me study. We sat on the floor, conjugating French verbs with magic markers on the pieces of poster board Billy and I had discarded. I had never beheld verbs so colorful. Conjugation after conjugation, they branded themselves permanently into my memory. Vanessa specialized in reflexive verbs. I recall, with a particularly warm and fuzzy feeling, her conjugation of, to sodomize oneself. We had a good laugh over that one. It was the most fun studying either of us had ever had. We agreed to do drugs and study together more often. <laughs> Having admired her wit, I admired her face. There was something unsettlingly familiar about it. Then, I figured it out. She was the spitting image of Carrie Fisher, in the role of Princess Leia. Did that, make our impending romantic encounter, the sexual liaison we were bound, no, faded, to have, that very night, incestuous. Suddenly, Billy burst into the room, followed by Mickey Mouse. They were both almost completely naked, Mickey except for her mouse ears, Billy except for a yellow ribbon tied around the tip of his member. Mickey, I noted, without, by this time, so much as batting an eye, was attempting to suckle Ramesses. We all took turns bowling. Vanessa threw a split. Billy threw a strike. I got hurt. Mickey left the nine pin standing. Vanessa found Ramesses in the Nerf ball box and started playing with him. He doesn't smell like dirty socks, she observed. That's because I use four paws ferret glow shampoo and deodorizer with aloe vera, explained Billy. I was parched. Vanessa was too. Together, we went in search of liquids. We found half a bottle of champagne on the downstairs banister, and sat on the steps sharing it. It was still cold. The commodes were finishing their last set with a heavy metal version of Lennon's Imagine, followed by the tune that would make them famous. An acoustic, punk love song, punctuated with country riffs, that went all the way to the top of the charts, entitled, Hopelessly Demoted to You. Vanessa and I passed the bottle back and forth, while discussing food, religion, sex, and how and where we wanted to be buried. I prefer ethnic cuisine, I said. How do you define, ethnic? She asked. You know, ethnic. Well, she said, 
I grew up eating Irish food. Potato this, potato that. But I gave up Catholicism with my virginity. And when was that? I wondered. That's for me to know and you to find out, she replied. Really? I said. Really? Interesting. You know, Vanessa, I'm something of a born-again pagan myself. If and when I die, I want to be cremated. Me too. She exclaimed. Burned to ash and sprinkled over Machu Picchu. In all the time, and all the ways, I was destined to know her, I was never able to get a handle on Vanessa. One minute, her art seemed all innocence. The next, her innocence seemed all art. And I fell for it. Every jot and tittle. Hook, line, and sinker. Again and again. Blindly. Blissfully. We polished off the champagne, while the commodes packed up their equipment. The party was coming to an end, in that sad way parties do. In the meantime, Vanessa and I had gotten friendly. I was on the verge of planting a champagne-soaked kiss on her strawberry lips. When a clothed Billy appeared behind us like the ghost in Hamlet. Boo! He shouted. I nearly jumped out of my sheet. The empty champagne bottle squirted out of my fingers and went crashing down the stairs. Cut the funny stuff, you two, said Billy. Let's go back out. Where, I said. What time is it? Asked Vanessa. Nearly five, said Billy. I should be going, said Vanessa. So soon? I asked. I've got an eight o'clock. And you have a midterm, she pointed out. Touché, I said. We'll continue our conversation later, Luke. I look forward to it, I said. Unreal party, Billy, said Vanessa. Glad you enjoyed it, he replied. You sure you're okay to drive? You're welcome to crash. Thanks, she said. I rode my bike. I'll be okay. Billy and I escorted her to the front door and stood watching, as she gracefully mounted her Schwinn 10 speed. Oh, the things she could gracefully mount. She smiled, waved a coquettish wave, and blew us both a kiss, before pedaling swiftly down the dark driveway, and vanishing like a vision in the night. Won't you look at that, said Billy. What the hell do you think I've been doing, I said. Keep your fingers crossed Luke, and you may get lucky. I'm keeping everything crossed, I said. I wonder what color her bush is, he said. I wonder. The finest piece of ass in pulpit hell with brains, to boot. I'd cut off my left nut for a shot at that. That's nothing, I said. I would eat the corn out of her poop. That's disgusting, Luke. But it's a great image. You should copy it down in your writer's notebook for Mrs. McGoo. Like one? Asked Billy. What the hell? I answered. It was the timeless period between night and dawn. Billy and I lay on our stomachs, side by side, smoking Dunhills, in somebody's front yard down the street. A black cat lazily crossed the road in front of us, arching archly in the lamplight. You know, said Billy, I'm a sucker for pussy. There's an old South American saying, to the effect that in the dark, all cats are black. Don't tell me you're still hung up on the color of Vanessa's bush, I said. No, Luke. I'm over that, now. But I did just realize something. What, I asked. I seem to have two opposite effects on the women I become involved with, he said. Either they go crazy, or they disappear. What about you? What do you do to women? I've only been with one woman since, you know, I became myself, I said. What happened? Asked Billy. She stoned me, I said. Yeah, I remember now, from your story. The bitch. Yep, I said. You learn as you burn, said Billy. Sadly, I replied. Riders, said Billy. The walking wounded. I let my cigarette hang from my lips and ran my hand down the side of my face. Even though I had just shaved, I needed to shave again. I had been through a lot in 12 hours. 
Not to change the subject, Billy, but how on earth did you get a name like Morocco? Probably the same way you got Solomon. One day, it just came to me. It seemed perfect for how I wanted my imaginary life to be. Exciting, exotic, a little dangerous. For years, I had been so average. Average build, average face, average mind. So, the first step was to radically change my name. You mean, you remember what it was like, you know, before? I asked, astonished. Of course, replied Billy. I chose to remember. I take it you did not? No, I said. It's just as well, Luke. My real life memories are pretty depressing. What was your real name? I asked. Promise you won't laugh. Promise. Okay. Rudolf Carlyle Stoutbridge. Rudy, for short. Hey, you promised not to laugh. I'm not laughing, I said. I am merely simulating laughter. Asshole, he said. Ever think about dying, Billy? Not much. Why? I don't know. Sometimes, I think I'll die before I reach 30. Not if you don't want to, said Billy. I guess not, I said. Bad trip? He asked. Strange trip, I said. I got in a fight with this huge black and white spirit. I morphed into a comic book character sort of like Batman, and the spirit morphed into Darth Vader, and then I morphed into Luke Skywalker. We fought in the Roman Colosseum. Did you kill it? Inquired Billy. The spirit, I mean? No, I answered. I got pulled away. You are one lucky son of a bitch, Luke. Why do you say that? You just met your ally man. My ally, I said. You mean you never read Castaneda? Asked Billy. Not that I, I began. I know, interrupted Billy. Not that you remember. By any chance, did you experience tremors up and down your spine? Yeah, I said. Tons. All over my body. I thought I was going to shake my skin off. How did you know? Don Juan tells Castaneda that such tremors indicate the presence of the ally, he said. If it was my ally Billy, why the green goddamn did it try to kill me? That's what allies do, he explained. They test you. If you are strong enough, you survive and win their loyalty. And if you're not strong enough? I asked. You're a crispy critter, he said. Do you have an ally? I asked. I don't believe in allies, he said. I think Castaneda is full of crap. But you just said. I know what I said. And I even believed it, once. He tapped his cigarette and the hot ash sizzled and died in the damp grass. I am afraid there is no such thing as enlightenment, Luke. No grand mystery to be revealed. Life is a joke. Simple as that. The only honest gesture is laughter. <laughs> I don't believe you, I said. I don't believe you really feel that way. Believe whatever you want, my imaginary friend. Just hang around long enough. You will see. Life is the ultimate postmodern novel. There is no classical totality, no unifying plot, no moral. Life is merely a series of random, unrelated chapters. So, that is why you never participate in class, I said. Since there's no use even trying to order the chaos, or touch people with your words, you've become a cynic. More or less, he replied. That's bullshit, I said. Maybe, he conceded. I guess you don't believe in love, either. Not really. You don't believe two human beings can connect on a higher level? I said. No. So, why stay alive? Got anything better to do? I asked you a question. Curiosity, I guess, he said. For instance, Luke, I'd like to know what in the hell is in the back of that pickup. It looks nuclear. I turned in the direction Billy indicated to find an old Ford flatbed rumbling our way. It could not have been going more than five miles an hour, tops. 
the black-faced beggar I had mistaken for blue on Jefferson Street, was at the wheel. Billy wasn't exaggerating. Something on the truck bed was casting a weird, green light in a thirty-foot radius. What do you think, it, is, I whispered, suddenly and inexplicably afraid. Be damned if I know, said Billy. The pickup was almost directly in front of us. It seemed to pass in super slow motion, like the hour hand of a clock. I did a double take. It was, blue at the wheel. At least, I thought, it was. I could have sworn God damn it's bushy tail was wagging like a metronome in the passenger seat. Blue, or his double, grinned familiarly in my direction. Or did he? Just to be on the safe side, I grinned back. The truck kept moving. There was the sound of a bark. Or a backfire. Finally, the bed inched into view. What Billy and I saw there would impact our imaginary experiences dramatically. Seated upright against the cab was a small statue of the Buddha, about the size of a fire hydrant, painted, or was it actually, glowing. Margarita Green. He had a portly belly, sported a mole-like urna between his sleepy eyes, wore an enigmatic smile, that could just as easily have been a frown, and held the familiar pose, left hand in lap, right hand fingers grazing the ground, known as, calling earth to witness. He seemed altogether alive, as if he might speak or sing at any moment, and radiated an intense, if impersonal, beneficence. Billy and I were both filled with a sense of things larger than ourselves, larger than reason, and both broke simultaneously into uncontrollable tears and laughter. Having glimpsed, however briefly, the magic inherent in all, purely imaginary, things. Then, the pickup its driver, its passenger, and the little glowing green Buddha vanished. Or maybe I should say, melted around the corner. In the blink of an eye, the world reverted to normal. It was as if nothing the least bit, out of the ordinary, had occurred. There might never have been a truck, a driver, a dog, a statue. Amazed, Billy and I stared hugely at each other. Dawn had arrived cracking open the sky like a can, of sardines, and washing the world with baby pink and blue. We fought against our speechlessness, then accepted it, aware, that a profound riddle, had just asked itself.